and explain perhaps the background of professional rugby a little bit. So from 1996, as everyone alluded to, the game was um, amateur, and overnight to professional. It was suddenly leapfrogged into professional environment. No one really knew what they were doing. I, I joined Leicester in 97. It was a shambles, to be honest. Um, you know, there was very little direction about what happened. There's two ex-players who became coaches uh, overnight. And all their experience was what every other ex-player done when they became a coach. And so there was little fun. There was um, a lesson that happened. There was a lot of fighting. Uh, but there was little intuition in terms of trying to get better. Everything was done in a group. And it was picking people out with sick people with the coach, looking at the video screen, um, VHS and Peter Maxi. Newcastle in those days. And we just play the tape and just point out everyone's faults. You, know, you can't do this, you mustn't do that, that's not right, this isn't correct. And there was no real specific team for you because there was no TV footage. And obviously nowadays with, with Sky and BT and BBC and terrestrial channels, about six games a week are covered. So we can get a lot of footage of opposition and there's often third party statistical companies. And professional was obviously, uh, because it turned overnight, was very shambolic. We fast forward now to 20 years on, I guess, or 18 years or so. We're very clear with what we want to try and do and get out of our team. We're a very structured uh, rugby organisation for those that sort of play, see us play. Um, we've gone back six years, we're unbelievably structured to the extent that we only play three phases and kick. Uh, we've changed a little bit since then. We're very clear about what we're trying to deliver to our players. We want them there for a short period of time so they remain energised. We had a statistic that over 100% of a week, 7% were actually at the club. 7% of the other club where you have to work hard, give your best, be intense, be physical, be committed, 93% of your own time. Um, they're want to try and give quite tight previews so the guys can take away what the information they have, what's relevant to them, what's pertinent to them individually, and then collectively the many groups <coughs> of the team. And after that, we always try and teach them the positive. We try not to say, don't do this, rather do this. Have you ever thought about this? Why don't you try this? Have you seen how he did this? as opposed to, that's bullshit, that's wrong, that's crap. Um, and as I said, I believe now, uh, despite all the star chips that we may or may not go on, an unbelievable uh, professional organisation. Which obviously brings us to the sort of birth of one day Saracens, if you like. And at the crux of it, Evan alluded to it, is this notion, this whimsical notion that we're here to create memories. And you might see it in that trophy cabinet down the bottom there, that memories is what matters. Trophies will come and go, trophies will rust, but your memories will stay with you forever. And that's all about the heart that Edward want to try and do. Edward spoke about the tyranny of the results. You try not to say, we must win this game. You don't want to verbally talk about winning at all. You are desperate to win, believe you me. We're absolutely desperate to win. We just don't talk about it. We talk about the process rather than the outcome. And we might be onto something. And for that, we're trying to play to, to this. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen this before. Um, the golden circles of success. Unbelievably simple diagram, which is simple like me, pretty handy. It's, it's author, a guy called Simon Sinek, believed that he stumbled across a pattern, um, a pattern that he recognised in inspiring and, and great organisations and leaders and how they operated within that, within that. And he thought it was the complete opposite of other failing organisations. If you allow me to try and codify what these three sort of circles mean. So the what I guess is what you do. Um, we play rugby, we <coughs> sell cars, Apple sell computers. The how? is the process, the USP, the proprietary process, the trade secrets, how you realise the what, it's how you go about doing things. And the why is a sort of more flimsical notion really, it's the purpose, what you believe, why do you exist, not to make money in a, in a financial organisation, not to get a victory, but what's the cause, what's the purpose, how do you inspire people? And most people operate from the outside in, and it makes no sense, it's the most tangible thing, what you do, what the product in front of you, what the game of rugby, and then working towards the inside, the fuzziest thing. But he believes that the most inspiring people, the most inspiring organisations and teams and groups of people do the complete opposite. Strongly drivers, inspiring people, and make people care. And what he tried to suggest was this was based on cancer biology, not psychology. If you take a cross section of your brain, there's three parts of your brain that he looks at. The outside part of the brain is your homo sapien brain, your neocortex. And that relates to all your analytical and rational thoughts and responsible for language. The two inside are the why and the how are like the Olympic brains. And they're responsible for all your feelings, like trust, loyalty, and it drives all human behaviour. So when you speak to people on the outside with facts and figures and at what level, you correspond there. Yes, they can understand information, it just doesn't drive their behaviour. But if you speak to people on the why level, then it drives their behaviour and you create feelings like trust and loyalty, important things they want in a rugby team. You make people care. 
And perhaps one of the great examples he's uh, given is related to this fellow here, um, Samuel Pierpont Lang, which you probably haven't heard of. But these two here, all of the world the right might well have done. So at the start of the 20th century, the race of man part of life was like a dot com of the day. And Samuel Pierpont Lang was the bookie's favourite, if you like, he had all the recipe for success. He had uh, $50,000 given by the US War Company to fund his flying machine. He had the New York Times following everywhere, he had the brightest minds, he was unbelievably well connected, he never seemed Harvard. On the other hand, Walter and Wilbur had no money. They funded their dreams to try and change the world with the proceeds of the bike shop in Daytona. They had no college education between them and no college education on their staff. And the New York Times told them nowhere. Now, the reason we don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley is that in 1717, 1903, when the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He left. He was motivated by different things. He was motivated by the outcome. He wants to be rich. He wants to be famous. Whereas every other word for the Wright brothers was driven by their common belief, their shared belief, that we would change the world and how we operate from there. They wanted to change uh, the world through flight. And I guess that's what we try and get to things. We want to try and create something. We want people to believe in what we believe. We want people to believe in the Saracen's way, in the things that everyone spoke about off the pitch, specifically on the pitch, how we go about things that are a little bit different to most groups. How do we go about it? I guess six and a half years ago, um, when it all starts with Brendan and, and Edmund, they nailed down sort of four core values that you might have seen up and down the stands, like you've definitely seen them about six foot letters from this stand that we're in right now. And we had honesty, work rate, and discipline. After winning the, pre uh, the Premiership in 2010, we had this humility. Now, as you can probably imagine, in team meetings and talking to players for six and a half years, where we have three, four meetings a week, talking about these same core values can get quite boring. It's the same thing, same monotonous mess, the same rugby mess, the same plan, the same structure, this line out, this set piece, uh, this defensive structure, this defensive shape, this attacking shape, this play, and we go for a wide break down, and so on. So we try to make things a little bit fun when we try to educate the players, which is where this guy comes in here. So far repeat. Um, Probably like a modern day Steve Irwin, if you like, but he lives in Watford. Um, <laughs> and he's got like a menagerie of exotic pets. He's got like an iguana or, or something here over his head. He's got tarantulas and snakes and so on. And what he doesn't know about pets, you don't know, I don't know about roughly. And we use pets and animals uh, often for analogies. There's a lot of easy things to sort of correlate with nature. Um, this is, believe it or not, a plan when we played Edinburgh in the Hamilton Cup two seasons ago. And um, each sort of coil. This is a python, uh, a very basic python, but a python nonetheless. Each coil on the bottom responded to an area of the game that we wanted to exert some pressure, trying to suffocate the opposition at Edinburgh and Simpson. So through our kicking game, what was specific, where we wanted to kick, how we wanted to kick. Again, as I said, simplified. The coach would be explaining exactly the detail. We try and give simple messages. After that, the defense, what was pertinent about our defense? We had a big leg focus. We have a little acronym uh, for those that like acronyms. Legs, legs equals game line success. So, we're a big leg focus uh, basic, uh, basic team. After that set piece, simple word, I guess, dominance, but we have some images to show that. And then we've got all this pressure. That would unleash the sting, if you like. That would unleash the attack and what we need to do. And for that one, as it happened, I actually have a python wrapped around me, uh, suffocating me as it happened. It wasn't the only python around me, but it was pretty dangerous. Um, and on top of that, of course, if you've had the wolves come in, you've probably seen uh, lots of things associated with the wolf pack and so on. Trademark that, so you can't copy it. But it, is, it is a wolf pack, we brought them in, and uh, this is good stuff for the boys. It's a bit of fun, really, you're trying to engage the group as much as possible, you're trying to make them believe in something over and above. Defending's a pretty shitty sort of thing to do for most people, you know. It's not in your nature to have a guy 18 stone runs towards you, and you want to try and stop them and knock them back. So we try to make the fun, we have merchandise, we have caps and t shirts and vests and all sorts of bits and pieces, with the awards, prizes, chocolate bars, and what have you. Try to energize the folks on being able to defend. Well, there's a bit of a method behind the madness, I guess. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have been familiar with bath testing. Give or take. Okay, so, so in, in short, I guess, um, bark, B A R K, visual seeing what we're trying to present to you now. So the slides that we try and show, try and touch upon those players that can take in information the best visually. Uh, after that, auditory, it's me talking to you, and talking to you after the dentist. Uh, reading and writing, all the players have their own iPads, and we've got a Saracens application where the information is downloaded, and they can stream games, watch their own footage, um, see their own statistical analysis after the game, and so on. And then kinesthetically, the act of doing something. And most rugby players still 
third act of that constructive learning. So I wouldn't pitch that during training. And if we can't do it full contact or we can't do it at full pace, we trigger it. We go through slow motion, walk through an option in the line out without jumping in the air. We walk through a play uh, in a new shape of defense, perhaps off, off nine, um, or new shape off nine and attack, and so on. And, and likewise, back to set ups as well. Furthermore, we also uh, psychometrically test the players and we use a sort of Myers Brick profile, probably the most common uh, profile available. In a sort of layman's terms, I guess, we try to divide up into the left hand side brain and the right hand side brain. So the right hand side brain people are big picture, they like the stories, the analogies, the pythons, the walls, and the <coughs> shit. The left hand side is those that are sort of um, logical, analytical, thought based, system based, process driven. Uh, to give you a player example, perhaps the best is a is a skull bridge towards the right hand side, and the left would be the Steve Walker. Sometimes it gets a bit merged. When we first did this testing, uh, Rich Coper, uh, one of my second owners, just left to join the Sharks, he filled in these forms and did the questions and so on. He thought he wanted to write down the answers that he wanted us to hear that he was writing in. As it turns out, he put himself like Steve Walker, and he is so right side brain, it's ridiculous. And we started presenting information uh, for two or three weeks only, and it didn't quite work for us, but we did two presentations. Forward. So there was one group with um, everybody bar two people, which was white side grey. And then there was Steve Walker from Ritz Bogle in another room, where I was black and white on the screens, <laughs> this, driven like this, and, and, and didn't know what to be honest. But, uh, yeah, so we do, we do bark testing, psychometric testing, to try and get the information across. It's obviously unbelievably important, and we try and touch upon them. So everyone walks away from a meeting taking some sort of information. Now, information is obviously brilliant, it's powerful, but only if it's accurate. And for that, we have an unbelievably heavy process regarding our, 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 our analysts uh, for the game. So here are on Wednesday 18, and this is where our work starts in earnest really, not for this weekend's game of course, but for the weekend after. So we have 10 days preparation for Newcastle um, here at our, our next weekend. And it all starts with this guy, Dr. Bill Gerard, who's a statistician uh, based in Leeds. He was involved with Billy Bean and the Moneyball uh, side of things you might have read about. And he sends through a report. Now he's not a, a rugby guy, he's not a sports guy or anything, he's, he's a pure maths guy. And he tries to get black and white information, and from that information, give us some kind of picture that he sees based purely on statistical evidence, purely based on data that Opta provide. And you see about 15 pages or so of information, which is, which is a pretty lot. Um, and he gives us these sort of heat maps um, for each game. So there's three games here, for example, just to show you. Based on the key areas of the game that we think, so the set piece, the defense, the kick again, the attack, and the breakdown. Five key fundamentals based on the game. Um, and from that, he gives a twos analysis, um, which, you know, there's, there's some snippets in there from time to time where you manage to put in a little bit of data relating to, for example, um, a team's attack, where they may make the most of this game, what that might affect on us, and I want to just uh, break down the game. Um, and so, but it's basically fundamentally trying to digest data and give us back a snapshot from somebody that isn't looking at the videotape, it's just looking at what the records show, what the data shows. And after that, each coach gets four games of the opposition, as I said before. In the olden days, VHS, Beta Max, which you fast forward, rewind, fast forward, rewind. Now it's all on the computer, you have sports code, game break, <coughs> you can try and look at the games and fast forward and slow them down and pause them and find new details to try and get, uh, try and get an edge. And each coach has an individually clipped folder. Um, in short, I'll get some like this put on my desktop this morning. A lot of information, it's 12 gig. I don't know what a gig is, that's not a lot. That's a lot. Um, after that, I guess, like most things, we have to learn on what we've, what, we've, what we've done in the past against certain teams. Newcastle, we'll look back at what we did in terms of our preparation last time. We'll look back at what our review was from Newcastle last time. What did we feel? What went wrong? What went right? What would we try to do that time again? Which course we do, of course, in 10 days' time. What happened in seasons gone by? What, what plays did they sign maybe in the interim? Um, is everybody injured? Is everybody went to Six Nations? And so we try and put that all into this melting pot that Dr. Bill's data doesn't show. It doesn't show people, it just shows data. And then we get a referee's opposition report. It's everybody referred to. Sometimes the referee has a massive bearing, uh, an outcome on the game, um, which is out of our control. And it would look something like this. This would be one of our opposition reports put together by a video analyst. So we've got each coach, we've got five coaches looking at four games. We've got a video analyst looking at the game, and he gives a snapshot, six pager which goes to the players as well. And then we also have a referee's report from our junior video analyst who looks at where penalties like to come from, um, what referees like to penalise, is it going to be more uh, lenient at the breakdown, therefore we can test a little bit more, maybe our release isn't quite as quick. 
is more likely to penalise uh, producer as either in the scrum, uh, infringement of the earth, in the underlying acts, and so on. And from that, that can try and tailor our training. So we get that information today for next week. So we're sort of ahead of the game a little bit in terms of how we're going to structure our training and look after it. And after that, we get code specific analysis. Now, this is what a fancy sort of thing I have to do today. And this is via desktop. Um, and this will be your bad things. Oh, sorry. Should be something happening about now. Lewis? Okay. No. Okay, no problem. Okay, so we get to look at different things. So I, I'm responsible for the Teams defense, I also do the line outs. What I was trying to illustrate there would be able to show you um, how the flows are broken down. So you get roughly 80 to 100 line outs to watch in any given game. It's 15 line outs, it's out of 15 line outs, that's what four games work. So you get to watch these games, you can look at it from um, field positions, you can look inside your 22, 22 halfway, halfway 22, and then inside our own 22. You can look from a four man, five man, six man, seven, you can look at it with the uh, terms of delivery, from, uh, if it's off the top, if it's driven, if it's down, it gives so on. We try and work out patterns of how they do things, do they do anything specific in any area of the pitch, and likewise, what sort of defenses they do in different areas of the pitch. So we try and get as much information as possible, and from that, we get these uh, pitch sheets I put together for the boys. Uh, and again, we try and make it a little bit interesting, get a bit visual for them, and this goes on their iPads, it's a bit of interaction, there's linked to some tape, and we also present some meetings so they can try and get that as well. And I guess the last thing, I don't know if anyone's read the, uh, the book Blink by Mark and Gladwell, but he talks about this thing, uh, Thin Slicing, where you take a snapshot by experts, they take snapshots, and their gut feel, if you like that feeling, gives them a gut feel about something which can often be right. So we also take that into account. Sometimes you just have a gut feel that player X should play this game. You should just play this game. There's no real reason why you should do. It's four months in China, but player X has proven in big games in the past. He's got money in the bank, he's got credit in the bank. We feel we have to play it. So in short, so over the week, this is what it means to me as a coach. We have about six hours or so uh, of watching opposition uh, during the week. So uh, from today onwards, up towards sale on Saturday, I'll be watching Newcastle. Then the day after, we'll go into later on about the work we do after that. About two hours of watching those 120 line outs, give or say, trying to digest information, produce a picture for the boys. Two hours of coaches talking in our room together, talking about what we need to do, the plans and action, what we do we have to do, uh, what we have to get right for the following week, and so on. And then I have about an hour of sort of work of line out meeting with the rest of the line out course. So in this case, Alistair Hargreaves, Hayden Smith, and Mara Tosh, and these guys. We sit down and talk about the options we want to take in. Give or take, we have about 160 line out options uh, built over the course of periods. We draw down 20 options, uh, more or less, for every game going to. So it'll vary with options that we've into an opposition. We'll try and pick on current trends, we'll try and pick on hinges that we feel we can exploit. Things that are just basically work well are quite hard to stop as well. After that, we have these sort of units and individual meetings with the players where we try and go through some bits and pieces that we feel they need to get right in their game, be able to see them up in the picture. And then there'll be about four hours of practical training. Um, during the week, as I say, we try and bring all the information and we've tight to four, four uh, games worth of information. We only give the players about six to eight minutes during the week in terms of our meeting, of course, just to watch. So they'll get, if I see a uh, shape off nine defensively, I might have seen it 44 times over four games. I'll show them this to take my word as gospel, if you like, in that sense, and they trust me in that sense that this is the shape they're likely to place against. They don't need to, need to show against Claremont, against Munster, against Newcastle. I'll show them once, see the shape, jobs are good, and we'll go and practice it later on. Um, so we're trying to disseminate information through mini groups, through individuals, and then through some different types of groups later in the week. And our meeting today, for example, only about two minutes, rubber specific information. The rest of it was a lot of whistles and bells and awards. And, Chocolate given and prizes and some whooping and cheering. Um, it's all good fun. In short, roughly about 80% of our working week is all about the, the, uh, the preview. It's all about getting prepared. And then the game's about 20%. So we we'll play sellers for game, hopefully we smash them. As I said, the defence coach, I don't know if I can see any point. And I did the slide, I can put that up there. <laughs> then really our work starts in earnest again. Uh, you know, after say, a lot of our job's done, up to the awards of the game, our, our last training session is tomorrow. Um, and then Friday the boys for the rest, we travel up to sale and play Saturday. After our last sort of touch with the players tomorrow, that's just done really. There's not much more we can do then in terms of the team. We get the team delivered to us at the uh, what sale pick on Friday at lunchtime and Friday of the week. Premiership teams are announced, European teams are announced at 12 o'clock. So there's any sort of small change in their personnel that might have influenced what they may or may not do. 
ask my people players. If nothing else, we really can do smaller conversations. Stand for players now to take ownership because they're the ones that make uh, decisions on the pitch. Um, after that, then, as I said, it comes back to us. So straight after the game, we get the game put on the track computer. Um, and our review process starts in earnest. Um, we analyse the game. It takes about five hours, give or take, now. Maybe four to four the hours of the day for a couple of beers while you're doing it. And you have to try and do your own individual areas. So I'm responsible for defence and the line outs. And we have uh, a certain amount of sheets that we fill in. We send them all off to Dr. Bill and uh, Deloitte as well. We're also working on the programme trying see how we can work this information, see what sort of trends we can pick up, see if we can forecast things before they even happen. Um, after that we meet up, we try and talk about these things, we get these sheets back from Dr. Bill and Reed. It goes through our KPIs, it's all traffic code, it's trying to make it really simple. Um, so, you know, red, obviously bad, it's not good there, they'll be defensively there for us. Um, amber's okay and, and, and gold's pretty good. Okay, so that's what we're trying to look for, for now, we're trying to get these things back. We get trained on the last couple of games, where we stand on the season average. Again, just trying to pick up things, see what information we can get, see what we need to try and say ahead of the curve. Um, during the game, we, we brought these things, Kevin Sarr, our backs coach, write what we call the story of the game. Um, other clubs are what we call like a momentum graph. So like we're trying to chart every single action in the game, uh, from when the move starts, from a turnover, from a set piece, um, from a breakdown. Is it positive or negative outcome? So it might be, for example, we turn up the ball, uh, we play four or five phases, and we kick it, we gain territory. It's a positive outcome. It might be we play three or four phases, dip around the halfway line, uh, it's a great turnover, and they go 20 yards. It's a negative outcome. And even if the five, six phases are all the positive, what happens from the start to the next breakdown happens? So we chart that, you can see there the first half where the green, we have actually a pretty strong sort of first half. Second half, although we maintained a little bit of momentum, the opposition certainly came back a lot stronger in the last 20 minutes. So we sort of have a belief that we don't want to have a negative on a negative. We don't want two uh, negative outcomes after each other consecutively. So what we have to do is try and arrest this. Um, we have a call in this club which is called Our Way. Sort of a pledge raised by the captain. The captain raises his arm, hands up in the air. Everyone recognises us, they all put their hand up in the air. It means to go back to our basic fundamentals, what's important to us. It's not necessarily just give the ball for 10 and kick it. It's not just play a, a short drop formation and try and set a target and play around the corner. It's doing the right thing that Saracens want us to do, doing the Saracens thing in the Saracens way. Um, that's what all we have is going to try to reference the development. The players get a real sort of abbreviated version of the statistical analysis that we've done. And we, as I said, we always try and just highlight the positive. We don't put any of that negative things in there. We don't put down uh, for anyone else to see uh, missed tackles or anything like this. They just try and see all that positive outcomes for the rest of the players to see, and we'll pick them up. Um, we have two things in the club we have a skill error. In the net error. So the skill error is my fault, so the rest of the coaches fault. We haven't um, helped the players get better enough. So someone giving them repeatedly good <coughs> passes off the left hand, for example, is the coach's fault. So we're not working hard enough for the kick chase, we're not working hard enough back to the feet defense, and we're not working hard enough to realign attack, that's a player's fault. Skill errors, we don't come down on them. Effort errors, come down on them like a ton of bricks. Their bargain is to work hard. Um, and then I guess from there, we go through our individual meetings again, review them, uh, one-on-ones, trying to again talk through, as I said, which don't try and talk in a, in a negative sense of them, but what else could you have done, uh, where could you have gone, what other options do you see now in the cold like the table kind of side. Union meetings again, we disseminate the information through there. As a group, we to do what we could have done better in the lineup, and the scroll, uh, from start to place, and so on. And then we have a generals meeting. Our generals are basically our leaders on the pitch, if you like. A nine, a ten, a line-up caller, a hooker, spine of the team, more or less. Uh, all the more experienced players in Australia have been there as well. Um, and that sort of things. And then from that, it goes to our team meeting. So within 48 hours or so, this has all happened. We've got there, we've got the information, and we're presenting again a review and a preview of the opposition within 36 to 48 hours. We're trying to get it into about 12 minutes, um, 12 minutes sort of encapsulating the snapshot of what we want to try and get right, what we need to get right for the forthcoming weekend. As much as possible, we'll try and pick on the faults, um, the things that have gone wrong, that are pertinent to the opposition in the weekend. So if we had a problem, which we did the weekend on Saturday, um, shape off nine, where we got cut two or three times outside the body forwards, and it happened, sail play a very similar shape. So therefore we'll work on that, rather than pointing out two or three other things, which also happened in the game, on that to try and make sure we get that right because that's the most relevant thing even for to serve. 
You don't have a lot of time with it. There's a low professional team, we only have four hours of tactical training. All of that was unit training, scrum training, line up training. As a team collectively, it's about two and a half hours. So it's not a lot, it's no more than perhaps an amateur team on a Tuesday and Thursday night we get together. Uh, so we want to try and maximize the time, also the ball's training very hard, we can and motivate and everything else. But we need to make sure we get things right. But I guess what's all for, you know, what, what's all this for, this goal and circle success, you know, the feelings, trying to create behavior and, and inspire people and make people believe, make people care. The charity work, the bark testing, the left side brain, the right side brain, the right brain. The values that we have are the boys write their own behaviors, try and underpin the values, things that they want to live by day in, day out, as a group that they govern. There's no uh, code of conduct at the club, by the way. There's no code of conduct at all. Players govern themselves. And the memories that you saw that everyone made. Um, and I guess for that, I'll tell you a little story that my dad once told me when I was captain for the first team when I was 15 or so in Northumberland. He said, Paul, uh, guess that. He says, Do you know what you've got? And you've got a group full of people who are like this, all with wandering thoughts, uh, all looking in different directions. Like, no doubt, no, the team. <laughs> and you've got a crowd. And Paul, Yes, sir. But do you know what you've got? You get everybody pointing in the same direction. Tadpoles swimming the same way. All the same pool. All the same direction. We know that. No more. You've got not. That's all we want to create in Saracens. When we know here, when we get this right, we're nine unstoppable. Our record last year was unbelievable. This year we've lost five games. When we get things right, we're nine unstoppable. But we don't want to be a faceless army. We want to have an army with a culture that cares, where players love each other, and we like to use the word love a lot. BLE, everybody loves everybody. I care for each other as people, as friends. And in 20 years' time, I go to Cape Town, bring a small Brits, go out for a beer, share some memories that we built together, and go out with our wives. And that's us. That's us.